Chapter 4.4 Evolution of Abstract Thinking Symbolism begets symbolism. Once you're locked into this synergy, it's hard to stop it from building a whole new world. Charles Foster, Reference 68 Chapter 4.4.1 Applications of Abstract Thinking In comparison to the timescale of evolution, human abstract thinking became very advanced very quickly. Humans started using their massive neocortices for advanced pattern finding to enhance their hunting and gathering activities. The ability to detect and exploit patterns is very useful for learning the behavior of surrounding fauna and flora. Sapiens also benefited from the ability to produce false positive patterns because it made them exercise more caution and increase the probability of detecting true threats. Another benefit to be gained from bi-directional abstract thinking is that it allows the imagination to influence the processing of the brain's sensory inputs, leading to the phenomena called symbolism. Thanks to symbolism, humans can produce and detect meaning from otherwise objectively meaningless sensory input data. Reference 68. The author has just described three of ten applications of abstract thinking mastered by sapiens over the past 50,000 years. 1. Advanced pattern finding. 2. Exercising caution. And 3. Symbolism. A complete list of 10 applications of abstract thinking discussed in this chapter is listed in table 1 below. Table 1 applications of abstract thinking and we have the 10 advanced pattern finding, exercise, caution, symbolism, planning and, strategi and strategizing, producing abstract simulations to forecast future scenarios within the safety and comfort of one owns of one, one's own mind, I'm sorry, semantically and syntactically complex language. Developing semantically and syntactically complex languages as a medium to exchange symbolically meaningful, conceptually dense, mathematically discrete, and precise information. Storytelling. Leveraging abstract thinking, imagination, and high-order language to construct virtual realities to share with other humans for enhanced relationship building, knowledge sharing, entertainment, and vicarious experience. Solving physically unverifiable mysteries. Explaining phenomenon impossible to objectively know or understand via physical sensory inputs most notably what happens after death. Developing abstract constructs and belief systems. Constructing theological, philosophical, and ideological constructs to explain, justify, or shape sapient norms of behavior. Creating and wielding abstract power. Creating abstract power and control authority over sapiens as a non-energy intensive and non-injurious surrogate to use a physical power as the basis for settling disputes, establishing control authority over resources, and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. Encoding abstract power, har power hierarchies. Formal codifying via spoken written language. Belief systems where people with imaginary or refined abstract power are organized into hierarchies. Chapter 4.4.2 Abstract Thinking Application Number 4 Planning and Strategizing Sapiens learned how to use their imaginations to improve their hunting capabilities by performing a special type of abstract thinking they call planning. Driven by the need to develop better hunting strategies to take down far more physically powerful pack animal species with high CA and low BCRA. Sapiens started using their overclocked and oversized brains to do something their prey could not, build hypothetical hunting simulations and test out strategies from the safety of their own minds. 
using imagination, humans learned how to render highly complex scenarios about the future that were not coupled to their sensory inputs or directly linked to any concrete experiential knowledge within shared objective physical reality. They could run multiple hunting simulations which never occurred and filled them with people, animals, objects, and environmental conditions that did not physically exist. They could down-select their best hunting strategies, test them in real-world operational environments, and use the exper experiential knowledge as feedback to train their mental models and make more realistic hunting simulations. Perhaps even more impressively, sapiens learned how to communicate and share these hunting simulations with their peers, creating shared object abstract realities, aka virtual realities, filled with hunters, prey, which did which do not exist anywhere except within their collective imaginations. This process through which sapiens mastered the primordial economic dynamics of hunting and becoming the world's peak predator. The primordial economic dynamics of hunting is illustrated in figure 39. Thanks to their big brains, humans were able to develop strategies which enabled them to increase the BCRA of their targets by reducing their CA. Gradually, over time, humans learned that the hunter's job is not merely to kill a target, but to prep the target for the kill over time by reducing its CA. Over thousands of years of planning, strategizing, and testing imaginary hunting scenarios through real world trial and error, humans mastered the art of prepping their target for the kill by reducing their CA using tactics like increasing standoff distance or taking advantage of topography of the local environment. Here we have figure 39, primordial economic dynamics of hunting, state A, hard to attack, low BCRA. Hunter's job is to prep the target for attack by decreasing their cost of attack. State B, easy to attack, high BCRA. For example, instead of trying to take on a powerful herd of caribou in an open field, like a pride of lions would try to take on a herd of wildebeest, humans took advantage of their advanced pattern finding capabilities to study the migration behavior of caribou, predict what paths they would take, and find the ideal spot along that path where their cost of attack is lowest to ambush them. This tactic is illustrated in figure 40, how to hunt caribou. Convince them to go into this canyon, high cost of attack zone, low cost of attack zone. Wait for them to get here to attack. Illustration of hunting strategies mastered by humans, figure 40. A herd of caribou is quite powerful and can impose a lot of physical cost on attackers in an open field. This area is marked in figure 40 as the high cost of attack zone. But caribou can't impose severe physical costs on attackers as effectively when they're wedged in the bottom of a canyon with spears raining down on them. That The area is marked in figure 40 as the low cost of attack zone. Thus, an effective hunting strategy for increasing the BCRA of a herd of caribou is to predict their migration patterns and find the spot where their cost of attack is the lowest due to the topography of the environment. Then simply wait for them to get there. To that end, humans can park themselves at the top of a canyon and wait for the caribou to arrive. Once they do, they can throw spears down on them from a safe standoff distance where their capacity to impose severe physical cost on their attackers is rendered useless or ineffective. While there are many peak predators intelligent enough to employ similar hunting capabilities, no surviving animal appears to be as skilled at hunting as humans are. 
hunting strategies like this require lots of abstract thinking because humans must use their imaginations to predict their praise behavior and intentions. This type of abstract thinking is what's known as intentionality or theory of mind, and sapiens are extraordinarily good at it. In fact, one of the most defining characteristics of behaviorally modern sapiens is that they have a remarkably high order of intentionality and theory of mind. Simply put, modern sapiens can predict and understand the thoughts and intentions of other brains remarkably well. The more thoughts and intentions one can predict, the higher order of intentionality they are said to have. But the more cognitively demanding it is to make those predictions. Fortunately, because sapiens have evolved much better thought process and hardware. They have become much better at predicting the mental states of other creatures and therefore have much higher orders of intentionality and much higher degrees of theory of mind. Another way to think about this is that, hum is that human brains are so large and powerful that they have enough spare thought process and margin left over to dedicate towards thinking as their neighbors. Not surprisingly, this makes the hosts of sapient brains except, exceptionally talented at hunting despite how weak their bodies are in comparison to the animals they frequently hunt. Sapiens have driven dozens of gigantic species to extinction, not by projecting more physical power than them, although the ability to wield fire clearly helped, but by outthinking them. A simple way to think about the strategic advantages of high order intentionality is that it makes sapiens way better mind readers than any other species on earth. Because they're better mind readers, that makes sapiens better hunters. What sapiens lack in physical strength, they make up for 10 times over with intelligence, specifically their ability to predict what neighboring organisms are going to think and do long before they think and do them. Animals often find themselves helpless against humans despite being far more physically powerful. This is because fighting a human is like fighting a Jedi. Humans are extremely talented at predicting what's going to happen before it happens and placing themselves in exactly the right position they need to be in to defeat their opponent. In a very short amount of time on Earth, sapiens have proven that advanced pattern finding combined with planning and strategizing using higher order intentionality and theory of mind is an extraordinarily effective power projection tactic. Between their ability to wield fire and their ability to effectively read their prey's minds by thinking like their prey, sapiens quickly became one of the world's most lethal predators despite being comparatively unathletic. Chapter 4.4.3 Abstract thinking application number five, semantically and syntactically complex language. The great thing about bugs is that nobody gives a shit if you kill them. Kenny the talking gun, gun high on life, reference 80. As sapiens further honed their abstract thinking skills, they graduated from imagining high realistic hunting simulations and imagining all sorts of other abstract realities. They, their overclocked and hyperactive neocortices started to assign abstract meaning to reoccurring patterns in their campfires and in the stars above their heads. They started using abstract thinking, not just to connect dots and fill gaps in experiential knowledge, but also to account for phenomenon they can't physically verify using sensory inputs at all. Most notably, what happens after death, reference 68. Perhaps the most disruptive application of abstract thinking to emerge after planning and strategizing was semantically and syntactically complex high-order language. High-order language enabled humans to share their individually imagined abstract realities together much more easily. This allowed them to synchronize their imaginary thoughts together well enough to create large-scale shared abstract realities. Before discussing high-order language, it's important for the reader to note that sapiens were well-equipped 
with rudimentary forms of language long before they learned how to use symbols to produce semantically and syntactically complex language. Humans communicate the same way many other mammals do, in ways that far predate words and grammar. And to many people's surprise, these instinctive communication protocols foster far deeper connections and bonding. Reference 68. Humans groom each other, dance, laugh, sing, and howl with each other. They also adjust their size and posture, make gestures with their appendages, beat their chests, stomp their feet, squint their faces, and use many other communication techniques that other mammals use. It is not uncommon to see animals of different classes, e.g. mammals and birds, communicate friendship or bonding exactly the same way via cuddling and grooming or grooming or with very similar body language. This is why humans communicate their trust and affection for each other and for their pets by cuddling and petting them. It's simply a common language between many species, especially mammals. Reference 68. On the opposite side of the communication spectrum is how animals signal pain, sadness, and suffer the same way. This topic is uncomfortable but relevant to discuss about human-on-human -human killing and why humans adopt systems to try to avoid killing. Mammals, for example, narrow their eyes and grimace the same, wince the same, and scream and whimper the same. Some biologists have argued that this is why humans often struggle to kill other mammals which are equipped with eyelids and vocal cords used to communicate pain and suffering the same way. Yet the same human who would never want to hurt a mammal would have no problem impaling, disemboweling, crushing, burning, electrocuting, or boiling fish, shellfish, or insects alive. The reason why this happens is because these different classes of animals have different instinctive communication protocols and therefore don't communicate pain, sadness, and suffering the same way. Reference 68. As illustrated in figure 41, if fish had eyelids or contortable muscles in their faces to communicate pain the same way mammals do, the experience of fishing would probably be much, much different for sapiens than it is today. This same phenomenon is believed to be the reason why domesticated wolves, aka dogs, evolved special muscles around their eyes to make sad expressions which appeal to their human masters. So-called puppy dog eyes are argued to be an evolutionary tactic which help dogs communicate to humans, particularly their sadness, pain, suffering, and desires in ways that humans intuitively understand. Some have argued that the cuteness of puppy eyes is a defense mechanism against the cruelty of their masters, and one of several reasons why the sad and pitiful looking dogs, expressions that humans might condescendingly call adorable, have survived as human pets. Reference 68 and 81. What fish look like when fishing? What fish would look like when fishing if they communicated pain and suffering the same way mammals do? Relatively minor differences in physical features communicate much different things to humans. Examples of how fish communicate differently than mammals. Figure 41. Both anthropologists and biologists have theorized that the double standard in predatory human behavior is the result of two different classes of species evolving two different communication techniques. And unfortunately for fish and insects, humans are incapable of detecting that fish and insects are in pain or that they're suffering. The study of fish and insect neurons have shown they are capable of nociception, detection of pain, and that they react the same way mammals do when they encounter extreme heat, cold, or other harmful stimuli. But these organisms lack the eyelids, vocal cords, and other musculature 
needed to grimace and howl to communicate their pain and suffering the same way most mammals do. So humans are naturally less reserved about harming them than they are about harming mammals which communicate pain and suffering the same way humans do. This small change in how different classes of animal evolve to communicate differently leads to dramatically different emergent behavior. Reference 68. This uncomfortable discussion about human predation is relevant because it explains why humans go to such great lengths to avoid the discomfort of killing and injuring other mammals, or why they are quick to outsource these activities to other people. The author has direct experience with this as both an active service, active duty service member, as well as their heir to a beef cattle farm. One popular anthropological theory posits that humans are highly capable of sensing that they are causing pain and suffering to mammals. They domesticate and slaughter. That they domesticate and slaughter. Okay. So they utilize their abstract thinking skills to develop imaginary justifications for their predation to reconcile the emotional discomfort. Some theorize that this need for emotional reconciliation was a leading contributing factor to the rapid adoption and sudden popularity of theistic religions following the domestication of animals. The theory posits that humans adopted abstract belief systems where they perceived themselves or other humanoid gods in their image to be the rulers of nature because it gave agrarian society a way to emotionally reconcile the guilt of being so predatory. Huh. It should be noted that predatory guilt is a unique trait of human predators. Other apex predators do not appear to feel guilty about their predatory behavior like humans do, possibly because they do not have the physiological capability, capacity, i.e. the brain power, or the theory of mind needed to imagine the pain and suffering they cause to their prey. The desire not to cause pain and suffering to other animals, particularly the animals which express their pain with eyelids the same way humans do, explains why humans adopted abstract belief systems where sapient pecking order is determined by people who have imaginary power over other people. Sapiens simply don't want to see each other experience pain and suffering while establishing their dominance hierarchies using physical power. Imaginary power hierarchies, aka polities like government, give people an alternative to use physical power to settle their intraspecies disputes and establish their intraspecies pecking order. The reasoning behind non-physical methods for establishing pecking order don't directly cause injury the same way physical power does, so they can't cause as much detectable pain and suffering. As a side note, it's worth noting that this reasoning ignores systemic factors contributing to warfare and is based upon the assumption that human pain and suffering are strictly the byproduct of a linear chain of events where the last event preceding the pain, e.g. being shot or stabbed, is the primary root cause of all human pain and suffering. As will be discussed in later chapters, this reasoning is flawed because it ignores important systemic factors which could contribute substantially to human pain and suffering, like dysfunctional belief systems which motivate physical conflict. Wow. In other words, these theories ignore why people become compelled to stab and shoot each other in the first place despite their natural instincts to avoid causing injury and suffering to their fellow species. Reference 68 and 70. Assuming these theories are valid, then another way to say the same thing is that one reason why belief systems like humanoid-centric religions and governments first emerged and became so popular is not just to explain the unexplainable, but also because of guilt. Humans have high order intentionality and theory of mind, which means they can imagine and empathize with the animals they prey upon, which leads to their feeling guilty for causing pain to these animals. 
unless those animals don't have eyelids or vocal cords, such as bugs and fish. To reconcile some of that guilt, sapiens adopt imaginary belief systems to either, one, justify their predatory behavior, or two, find ways to avoid having to use physical power or competitions to establish their pecking order. Oftentimes, their ex the explicit goal of these imaginary belief systems is stated to be to avoid having to use physical power to settle disputes and establish dominance hierarchy. Unfortunately, these belief systems frequently become dysfunctional, leading to humans killing each other despite their guilt or their desire to avoid it. Much more on this later. In addition to being able to communicate happiness or suffering to using common languages between mammals, sapiens also have a base layer common language specific to the species. For example, all sapiens smile, laugh, and sing exactly the same way, regardless of where they are born. Human children are born deaf and blind, who have never seen or heard other people smile or laugh, will smile and laugh the exact same way other humans do. Sapiens also instinctively communicate with others who have immature or undeveloped brains the same way, using a sing-song pattern of wider spectrum and varying pitch known as infant directed speech or baby talk. This is why humans baby talk to their babies, pets, elderly, or mentally handicapped people, regardless of their culture. Humans instinctively recognize they're having undeveloped they're having undeveloped and br developed brains and have a common base layer communication protocol for it. This also explains why people feel comforted when they hear other people baby talk. It's an instinctive communication protocol that connects humans on a far deeper level than modern spoken and written language. Reference 68. These communication techniques are purely instinctive. They're natural patterns of behavior passed on to us via our genetics. This means sapiens actually communicate the same way and more meaningfully, regardless of what higher order semantic languages they use. By singing, dancing, laughing, grooming, and baby talking with each other. It is possible to form deep, emotionally satisfying connections with strangers or people who can't speak or write the same higher order language. Hence, the romantic stories about strangers from different worlds who speak different languages but still find deep emotional connection with each other. For these reasons, it's not uncommon for people to be more emotionally attached and affectionate with their pets than with their friends and extended family members. The loss of a pet can be as emotionally traumatic as the loss of a family member because animals, mammals especially, bond the same way sapiens do without the need for semantics, syntactic, syntactics, and higher order language. The point is, spoken and written language is not as important for human-on-human -human communication as bonding, human communication and bonding as people think it is. Humans communicate the majority of their feelings using body language, and in other unconscious techniques, and then rely on semantically and syntactically complex spoken or written languages to fill in the smaller, finer de details of rational information. Reference 68. The main takeaway of this detailed exploration of communication is to illustrate that the primary value-delivered function of higher order spoken and written language is not to emotionally connect with each other because there are far more effective ways to do that than by using semantically and syntactically complex language. Instead, the primary value delivered function of higher order semantically and syntactically spoke, complex spoken and written languages appears to be to encode the deeper and more instinctive level of emotion and intuition sapiens use to facilitate connection and bonding. A higher order language is optimized for the transfer of facts and more precise descriptions of what people think and feel. This lets people synchronize their thoughts more precisely. 
Using spoken or written language, sapiens can effectively peer into the minds of other sapiens with much more precision and detail than other sapiens and fill other people's minds with their own precise thoughts. Reference 68. Large neocortices turn out, it turns out, are perfect vessels for the transfer of precise ideas. Large neocortices allow sapiens to construct higher order languages by transmitting, receiving, and processing complex audible and visual patterns and converting them into abstract thoughts rich with symbolic meaning. Once sapient brains became accustomed to performing symbolism, something which probably occurred by accident and then succeeded via natural selection as with most most things in nature. People quickly developed a habit of assigning symbolic meaning to commonly detected audible and visual patterns to create morphemes and the smallest meaningful lexical item used in higher order language. People quickly developed a habit of assigning symbolic meaning to commonly detected audible and visual patterns to create morph themes. The smallest meaningful lexical items used in higher order language. Over time, this process of assigning symbolic meaning to otherwise meaningless audible and visual patterns became increasingly more complex until the nature of the meaning assigned to various lexical items could be changed based off their composition in a process we now call semantics. Eventually, humans learned to combine various symbols with different semantic meaning into de discrete units of discourse called words, then combine them into mathematically formal and discrete structures like phrases, sentences, and grammar in a process we now call syntactics. Most high order spoken or written languages, including and especially the languages we use to program computers, are composed of these same two components. Shapes and sounds are imbued with abstract and symbolic meaning, semantics and then combined into some type of mathematically discrete and formal structure, syntactics, giving rise to complex language that we can use to convey both highly abstract and highly precise thoughts. This type of communication is not necessary for survival or forming bonds because humans spent most of their existence without it but higher order language is extremely useful as a medium of exchange for conceptually dense and mathematically discrete information through which people can use to share abstract and precise thoughts with each other. As will be discussed in the following chapter, the pinnacle of humans using symbolism to assign semantic and syntactically complex meaning to things in order to connect neocortices together is machine code. Using symbolic reasoning and language techniques like Boolean logic, sapiens can turn practically any physical state changing phenomenon into information that can be stored or transferred to other people or machines. The crown jewel of higher order, semantically and syntactically complex language is machine code. The ability to communicate with and through machines this remarkable application of abstract thinking is what makes the internet work. The internet is just people communicating to other people through physical state changing mechanisms using Boolean logic. A clear limitation of higher order language is that it only works for people who have taken the time to memorize the semantic meaning and syntactic structure of the language protocol. Whereas it takes no effort to learn how to communicate with strangers using singing, laughing, and baby talk, higher order languages take years, even decades to learn. 
Sapiens can and often go their entire lives with nothing more than a shallow appreciation for the semantic and syntactic depth of the language protocols they learn. This is perhaps because higher order language is merely a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. Most sapiens don't learn higher order language for the sake of knowing the semantic and syntactic details of a higher order language. They learn it for the sake of peering into the minds of other sapiens and connecting abstract realities together through a process called storytelling. Chapter 4.4.4 Abstract Thinking Application Number 6 Storytelling The pen is mightier than the sword. Edward Bulwer Linton Reference 82 By assigning symbolic meaning to random shapes and sounds, then using semantics to assemble them together into a common topological or audible structure, humans can exchange information with high levels of precision to communicate their abstract ideas. This capability allows sapiens to do something remarkable, connect their imaginations together to form a single shared abstract reality. This concept is illustrated in figure 42. Illustration of the meta metacognitive impact of storytelling, forming shared abstract reality, reference 76. And we have these brains sharing. Figure 42 shows how people create and develop common belief systems. Thanks to the invention of high order languages, two or more near cortices sees with no physical or neural connection can share this exact same symbolic experiences and knowledge allowing them this to think the same things detect the same patterns and even interpret the same meaning from mutually exclusive physical sensory inputs two brains can't share the same physically sensory input but they can interpret different sensory inputs the same way through higher order language, sapiens build shared abstract scenarios within their minds and fill them with emotionally complex and interesting people with multiple layers of mental states, perceptions, beliefs, desires, high order intentionality, and high degree of theory of mind. Non-physically existent people can be put into places which don't exist, surrounded by creatures and objects which aren't real. Moreover, their actions, motivations, and thought process, processes can be imbued with conceptually dense and symbolic meaning. From the safety and comfort of their minds, sapiens who know the same high-order language can experience and explore their imaginary worlds together. They can teach each other useful lessons, explain unsolved mysteries, offer profound insights, and steer sapient brains through quests, crucibles, and puzzles which allow their hosts to experience the full spectrum of emotion. Using a written form of higher order language, near cortices can connect together this in this way, not just across thousands of miles of space, but also across thousands of years of time, communicating asynchronously over timescales which far exceed their hosts' lifespans. Through written language, humans can even share the same abstract experiences with other humans who lived thousands of years before them. The author defines this extraordinary capability as storytelling. For the same reason that sapient brains are extremely gifted at planning and hunting, they're also extremely gifted at storytelling. There is a clear cognitive link between storytelling and hunting. Both activities rely on precisely the same set of cognitive tools, i.e. high order intentionality and theory of mind, with only minor differences in their application. This becomes extremely important, an extremely important concept to note for future discussions about hunting people through their belief systems by nefarious storytelling. There are solid technical and metacognitive grounds for sapiens to have an instinctive fear of or distrust in or attraction to good rhetoricians, e.g. politicians, religious leaders. To put it simply, 
Peak storytellers are peak predators. They deserve caution. It has been hypothesized that sapiens' unique ability to think abstractly, form symbols, develop higher order languages, and connect brains via storytelling is what enabled them to start to start cooperating at far higher scales than other packs of primates. A famous anthropo anthropological theory by Robin, Robin Dunbar states, there is a cognitive limit to how many physical features, i.e. patterns, a human brain can memorize. This would imply there's a cognitive limit to how many different faces a single brain can recognize and trust enough to cooperate with. This notional limit, often called Dunbar's number, is estimated to be approximately 150 people. Dunbar's theory offers a viable explanation for why human tribes did not exceed this number for many hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of abstract thought. Despite their big brains and all their excess thinking power, humans simply didn't have the memory to form meaningful relationships with more than 150 people, so they weren't inclined to cooperate at higher scales. Reference 83. Like the single-celled organisms discussed in the previous chapter, the inability to cooperate at higher scales inhibits humans' ability to grow their cost of attack and results in bounded prosperity trap, in a bounded prosperity trap. Despite their ability to control fire, small nomadic tribes of humans had relatively little advantage. They were not nearly as high on the food chain as modern humans are today. Sapiens were the only species of human to escape the bounded prosperity trap caused by Dunbar's number-induced cooperation limits. By Dunbar's number-induced cooperation limits. And it appears they did it in part by combining abstract thinking, theoretical planning, sim symbolism, high-order language, and storytelling together to create shared abstract realities and belief systems which enabled them to trust each other and cooperate at scales which far exceed the physical constraints causing Dunbar's number. Another way to think about storytelling is that it allows sapiens to mentally groom and bond with each other via stories rather than having to physically groom each other or even spend any time with each other, hence the deep emotional attachments people form with movie celebrities or other types of story characters. Mutually shared beliefs or stories enable sapiens to transcend the physical constraints of regular grooming to form trusting and cooperative relationships at much larger scale. For example, a single primate is capable of physically grooming one, maybe two other primates at the same time to earn their trust and cooperation. Meanwhile, sapiens can capture the attention and influence the behavior of thousands of other sapiens simultaneously using nothing more than a story to earn their attention, trust, and willingness to cooperate. That same storyteller can get those thousand people to trust and cooperate with each other by virtue of the fact that they now share the same abstract reality or belief system. Sapiens are, uh, sapiens are unique in comparison to other wild animals because they cooperate together simply because they believe in the same thing, not because they share the same physical experiences. This subtle but extraordinary difference makes sapiens much more capable of mass cooperation at scale. Why? For the simple reason that the ability to believe in the same thing is not constrained by physics, whereas the ability to share the same physically objective experiences together is highly constrained by physics. Storytelling can therefore be thought of as the glue which holds modern societies together. Without that glue, sapiens are both physically and physiologically incapable of cooperating together at levels exceeding small tribes. We literally don't have the time, energy, or memory capacity for it. 
This means a primary value delivered function of storytelling is to overcome the constraints of shared objective physical reality. We use our spoken and written stories to bypass the constraints of physics as well as the constraints of our own bodies to communicate with each other, inspire each other, cooperate with each other, and achieve things we could otherwise be both physically and psychologically incapable of achieving. If we didn't adopt common symbols, languages, stories, and belief systems, and instead relied exclusively on experiential knowledge and memory to cooperate with each other, we would need to have massive budgets of time and memory to develop the experiential knowledge needed to create connections and commit them to memory. We would need comically large brains very large appetites, and very long lifespans to achieve a fraction of the cooperation we can achieve by simply using stories. Storytelling functions as a life hack that sapiens unlocked by learning abstract thinking. Thanks to stories, people don't have to rely on interactions with other people to cooperate at scales that are up to 40 million times larger than Dunbar's number. They just need to hear the same stories and adopt the same belief systems. This explains why symbolism is extraordinarily effective at promoting higher levels of cooperation. It gets people to think the same way, believe the same things, and most importantly, signal to each other that they have the same belief system to facilitate higher order cooperation and trust. Humans can use their storytelling abilities to build shared abstract realities, which offer satisfying explanations for phenomena observed in shared objective reality. They can imbue objective physical phenomena with abstract meaning to make mutual experiences feel more profound and enjoyable. Then, armed with the symbolic meaning of the stories they tell, sapiens can cooperate at scales which far exceed their own physical and physiological capacity. In other words, storytelling is an abstract superpower, hence why Edward Bulwer-Lytton observed that the pen is mightier than the sword. A more technically accurate way to say the same phrase would be higher order Syntactically and semantically complex written language can influence, organize, and direct more unified physical power than a single person swinging a sword can. People can achieve things far beyond their physical limits using the right combination of stories by simply believing the same thing regardless of whether that thing is real or imaginary. Sapiens can sum their power together to achieve extraordinary things like, assemb like assembling at the International Space Station. Rooted at the center of all this achievement is something which doesn't even necessarily have to exist. The stories sapiens tell each other to cooperate at massive scale can be, and probably are, fictional. All that matters is that people believe in them. As long as people can stick together by believing in the same imaginary things, they can build the great pyramids of Giza. They can literally move mountains. Storytelling is how money current and currencies work. Money is nothing more than a belief system, one of many completely fictional stories told by storytellers that people voluntarily choose to believe in. By believing in the same money, i.e. medium of transfer and financial information, people can and will cooperate with each other at scales which far exceed their physical and physiological limits. On the flip side, when money breaks down, cooperation breaks down. If people stop believing in the same money, cooperation comes crashing down. A collapsing money is a collapsing society. It has ended several empires because money is a belief system. The manipulation of money, such as when manipulating the supply of money, is technically a form of passive-aggressive psychological abuse. 
A collapse in money is a collapse in society. It has ended several empires. Because money is a belief system, the manipulation of money is technically a form of passive-aggressive psychological abuse. Are you ready to step away from your abuser? Back to the text. People who distort the medium for transferring financial information are systemic predators who prey on people's belief system, eroding their ability to cooperate with each other and contributing to the collapse of society. The most successful monies have been those which physically constrain this type of systemic exploitation, e.g. gold. Add in all these concepts together, we get a comprehensive understanding for why symbols and stories are extremely important to the prosperity of sapiens. Symbols and stories breed common belief systems, and common belief systems have unrivaled success in the animal kingdom at achieving cooperation. By believing in the same stories told by storytellers, humans can cooperate at extraordinary scales, which dwarf other species. They can use that power to build pyramids or to impose severe phys physically prohibitive costs on attackers. This means cooperation is fundamentally a dual-use power projection tactic evolved by nature, a way to increase benefit of attack, increase cost of attack, and adjust benefit to cost ratio of attack. To project more physical power, simply sum it together by telling more compelling stories which motivate people to cooperate at a higher scale by adopting the same belief system. With the right combination of stories, humans can do things they would never otherwise be capable of doing. They can end old empires and build new ones simply by changing what they believe in. A good storyteller can facilitate sapient cooperation at scales which far exceed Dunbar's number because they don't require people to physically experience the same thing. They just require people to hear and believe the same story. Add to this phenomenon the fact that sapiens are extremely intelligent hunters who can control fire and tap into what is effectively an infinite supply of exogenous power from the surrounding environment. And it is easy to see why the stories told by sapiens, not the sapiens themselves, nor the technologies they wield, are extremely effective and asymmetrically valuable power projection tactic. tactics. Symbols and storytelling should never be underestimated. So civilizations rise and fall because of symbols, stories, and belief systems. Things which don't exist anywhere except within people's imaginations. The socio-technical implications of storytelling are simple but profound. Sapiens did not physiologically change after arriving at behavioral modernity to become more capable of memorizing faces. We are equally as cognitively constrained as our ancestors were during the Upper Paleolithic era. In fact, we are probably more constrained. Human brains started to shrink after they started domesticating themselves. Reference 68. The ability for sapiens to cooperate and function on scales up to nation state level is therefore derived predominantly from something as something abstract which resides exclusively within their imagination. That means things like national strategic security are heavily derived from stories more than probably anything else. To harness more physical power to increase CA and lower BCRA, tell persuasive stories. To capture more resources or be a good conqueror, be a good storyteller, and hunt humans through their belief systems. Here we begin to see the downside of storytelling. 
what humans gain in their ability to cooperate with each other, they lose in systemic security. A major downside to storytelling is that it makes it possible to hunt humans psychologically rather than physically. Recall from the previous section that a hunter's job is to decrease their target's cost of attack and increase their benefit to cost ratio of attack. Storytelling enables people to do this to other people, often without attributability, i.e. no blood trail. With the right stories, people will forfeit their physical power or lay down their arms. Sapiens can be domesticated by the stories they believe, and like lambs, they will walk straight into the slaughter. It's also possible to feed stories to human populations which divide them and make them less likely to cooperate. They can be convinced via theology, philosophy, and ideology to forfeit their physical strength for something which only exists only in their collective imagination. The bottom line is the prosperity and survival of the sapient species depends on the stories they choose to believe in. All of our combined achievements are irrevocably linked to our stories and combined belief systems. What a population chooses to believe has very, very, has very real, very meaningful consequences on their ability to survive and prosper. So it is extraordinarily important for them to pick the right stories and belief systems. Chapter 4.4.5 Abstract Thinking, Application Number 7, Solving Physically Unverifiable Mysteries. Another useful application of storytelling is creating explanations for phenomena that are physically impossible to verify via physical, sensory inputs, or experiential knowledge. The most common example of this is explaining what happens to sapiens after death. Upper Paleolithic sapiens came to believe in the same afterlife because of storytelling. The primary storytellers of this time were shamans who convinced their tribes the afterlife was a desirable place to be. Over countless years and countless campfires, shamans expanded on their stories, specifying details about gateways to the afterlife. They added more details about how they can access the gateway to the afterlife and even communicate with the deceased ancestors on the other side. Here, the first signs of abstract power began to emerge. An easy way to tell if human fossils are from a time after the emergence of abstract thinking and storytelling is to look for signs of a belief in the afterlife. Most animals show nothing more than a casual interest in the bodies of their dead. But storytelling humans who live within the past 50,000 years demonstrate substantial interest in the bodies of their dead. Signs of belief in the afterlife appear in the human fossil record at approximately the same time as other early signs of abstract thinking and self-consciousness. Belief in the afterlife is therefore one of the oldest known human belief systems. Section 68. Preparation for the afterlife is noteworthy because it demonstrates an understanding of oneself in relation to time, as well as indicates a time preference for future self over current self. Sapiens not only started to make a conscious distinction between themselves and others within their environment, but they also started to make a conscious distinction between their current selves and their future selves particularly with respect to living self and unliving self. Behaviorally modern Paleolithic sapiens started making careful preparations for their future selves via ceremonies like burying rituals. They indicated their time preference. They indicate they indicated their time preference for the future by virtue of their sacrifices in the present. The dead would be buried with valuable resources the tribe needs for survival, a self-sacrificial practice which makes no rational sense except for those who believe in and have a higher preference for an imaginary future self, living in a place after death.
through Paleolithic burial practices, we can see a signature characteristic of behavioral modernity, making meaningful sacrifices for something completely imaginary, their future self. Chapter 4.4.6, Abstract Thinking Application Number 8, Developing Abstract Constructs and Belief Systems. Upper Paleolithic shaman storytellers could answer questions about the afterlife which other members of the tribe couldn't even think to ask. These shamans could ostensibly communicate to tribal ancestors years after their ancestors' death, giving the shamans very high social value. Shamans could also imbue tribal activities with symbolic meaning, making tribal activities seem more blessed and profound. Shamans who were practically who were particularly skilled at storytelling, could persuade their peers to believe that a person's hunting and gathering actions represented much more than just the act of physically capturing resources. It represented something important or something even more novel at the time, something ideologically good. The emergence of the concept of good also meant sapiens could start engaging in activities that would qualify as being ideologically bad, giving rise to development of abstract to the development of abstract constructs we now call ethics and morals. As much as sapiens hubris often compels them to believe otherwise, there may not be anything objectively good or bad about anything we experience in shared objective physical reality. The quote here should have been things are neither good nor bad only thinking can make them so hamlet back to the text our brains may just be applying symbolic meaning to objectively meaningless things like we already know they can do effortlessly well but if for the sake of argument we assume there is such thing as objective good then there's nothing to say that sapiens are special creatures in the universe who are somehow uniquely qualified to define what good means. Interstellar travelers who visited Earth could have much different opinions about good than we do, a very common plot line in modern films. One possible explanation for why humans subscribe to moral, ethical, and theological and ideological belief systems is to provide abstract explanations for their natural instincts. As discussed previously, sapiens have an incredible capacity for using their imagination to detect patterns which don't, nece- which don't necessarily exist and come up with viable explanations for unsolvable mysteries. Well, natural instincts have clear patterns and are quite mysterious. It makes sense that humans would try to use abstract thinking to produce satisfying results for why they repeatedly f- feel compelled to behave in certain ways. Ethics and morals provide such logical and satisfying abstract explanations. For example, it's common for people to believe that the reason why sapiens don't like the idea of killing other sapiens is because killing people is bad. But by but at the same time, it is also logical to believe that killing people is immoral. Is it that killing people is immoral is an abstract explanation for what could just as easily be described and empirically examined as a very common natural instinct in multiple species across multiple different animal classes, which developed over a hundred of millions of years of natural selection for obvious existential reasons. If humans had no disinclination to kill each other over food and territory disputes, there would be less capable of cooperation and thus far less likely to survive and prosper in the wild against mutual threats. So killing people is immoral could just as easily be described as people who aren't instinctively disinclined to kill their peers didn't survive and prosper and pass on their genes as much as people who are instinctively disinclined to kill their peers. Morals and ethics can be used in the opposite direction too. In addition to offering satisfying explanations about natural instincts, abstract thinking can also be used to offer satisfying justifications for behavior which goes against our natural instincts. As discussed previously, animals within the same class often communicate the same way, particularly their pain and suffering. 
Many sapiens instinctively feel discomfort injuring other mammals or seeing them suffer because most mammals communicate their pain and suffering precisely the same way humans do, e.g. squinted eyelids, controlled facial features, contorted facial features, and screams. As previously mentioned, sapiens are far less uncomfortable killing and injuring non-mammalian species who are equally as capable of nociception, feeling pain like bugs, fish, and self shellfish. Sapiens regularly impale, disembowel, and boil these animals alive with little to no reservation, all because fish, bugs, and shellfish don't have eyelids, contort contorted facial muscles, or vocal cords to communicate their pain and suffering the same way mammals do. Reference 68. To repeat a previous point, Anthropologists have argued that theology became popular in the Neolithic age out of psychological necessity. The argument is that sapiens started believing in humanoid gods to alleviate their cognitive dissonance and emotionally reconcile the mass exploitation and abuse of the mammals they were domesticating. The incontrovertible foundation of modern agrarian society. Irrigating large amounts of rainwater land requires the entrapment and enslavement of a roach a roaches a roach to create plow pull and pack animals like oxen feeding densely populated areas like cities required massive scale entrapment enslavement and slaughter of animals like boars jungle fowl and Rocks to produce the bacon wheat for breakfast, the chicken wheat for lunch, and the beef we eat for dinner. In other words, running agrarian society involves a lot of mammals squinting their eyes, tensing their faces, and screaming as they are continuously bred by humans to be imprisoned, corralled, whipped, and slaughtered at massive scale. Today, we entrap and slaughter animals by the billions. Reference 68. The author does not intend to sound self righteous or judgmental. My family owns a beef cattle farm. The goal is to practice being technically valid, intellectually honest, and as amoral as possible when evaluating power projection tactics in agrarian society. It's hard to dedicate one's life to the agrarian lifestyle without being tempted by abstract belief systems which claim that sapiens are above other animals or that somehow their pain and suffering isn't as bad as we think it is because they are less intelligent than we are. Once people have adopted the characteristically Neolithic belief that sapiens have transcended nature and animals exist to serve them, it's not a major leap of cultural evolution to believe that gods exist or that these gods have a distinctively humanoid shape. A uh, distinctively humanoid shape. An easy way to justify our domestication of animals is by believing that we are the gods. This line of thinking would explain why signs of theological beliefs in the human fossil record explode after signs of agricultural merge. As Foster notes, artwork changes from humans living amongst animals running alongside packs of free roaming caribou with to cracking whips over the backs of their entrapped, genetically deformed, docile servants. Scenes change from sapiens living within nature to humans living above nature. Humanoid shapes started. Humanoid shapes start sitting on thrones, physically isolated from the wild, and looking down upon it. Reference sixty-eight. By the time written language emerged, sapiens had thousands of years of experience believing in gods and looking down on nature. This alone explains why the basis of many moral, ethical, and theological philosophies look down on nature too, and encourage humans not to behave like wild animals. The implicit assumption of these assertions is that the behavior of wild animals is somehow bad. The lion who kills the pack's cubs to keep the bloodline pure or the squirrel who eats her babies to avoid starvation is perceived as bad behavior. The act of being physically aggressive or using physical power to settle disputes, manage resources, and establish dominance hierarchies like wild animals do is asserted to be bad or animalistic, even though sapiens have never stopped behaving this way, hence war.
reference 68. The point of this section is to illustrate that theology, philosophy, and ideology are abstract and subjective constructs which emerge from sapient abstract thought. Many ideologies make bold assertions which imply humans know better than nature, that we are somehow uniquely qualified to know what right is. But an intellectually honest person should recognize that it may not be objectively true that sapiens have miraculously discovered a metaphysically transcendent, ontologically superior, or causally efficacious capacity for good and bad. It could be that sapiens have oversized, overpowered, and hyperactive neocortices optimized for abstract thinking combined with a lot of spare time on their hands. Sapiens clearly have a strong desire to produce explanations for natural instincts, as well as to alleviate the cognitive dissonance from acting against their instincts to reconcile and justify the massive scale predation and systemic exploitation of the natural environment we now call modern agrarian civilized society. But the idea of good and bad doesn't appear to have existed anywhere except within the imagination of humans. There is little indication that other living creatures, particularly the ones with small neocortices, can detect them. But even if we assume that other animals can behave in moral good, it's not safe to assume they would have the same beliefs about the morality of sapiens as sapiens have about themselves. Even if we take the position that humans are special, unique, and favored within the universe, sapiens still have nothing to quantify one combination of time, space, mass, and energy as more or less good than another combination of time, space, mass, and energy. Theological, philosophical, and ideological constructs are demonstrably subjective. Different societies have had very different moral and ethical beliefs, probably because they grew up listening to different stories told by different storytellers. We can't even agree between ourselves what moral means. Sapiens commonly use physical power to settle their disputes about what good or God means, and or who has the right to define right. This brings us to a uniquely human power projection tactic, creating abstract imaginary sources of power.